is the way. And the reason why it's called narrow is the way is because the life that we live and the path that we have to go on seems so narrow sometimes. You know, trying to live in the world but not be of the world. Trying to learn to live in Christ when the world is so far from Christ. And it is something that's so evident in our lives. And the more that you live in this world, the more you find out how difficult it can be. And we're coming into a time in our lives when the world has gotten even tougher. And, you know, the Lord has made ways for us. He's provided for us in certain ways. But there's one thing that is really needful in our lives, and that is how strong is your inner walk with Christ? How strong is that inner walk so that no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, no matter what goes on around you, you know that place where Christ lives deep down inside of you. You know it so well that you live there and not in the world. Unfortunately, most of us from about 8.30 in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night, maybe some people go to sleep earlier and some people live like, you know, Count Dracula, come up at night. <laughs> the only time that sometimes that people have any peace in their life is when they're asleep. And even then you wake up in the middle of the night and you realize, oh my gosh, I've got this stuff going on over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in our hearts, in our minds. And what we're going to show you today is that very thing that is going on in your life is actually the very thing that will teach you how to get out of it, if you can catch it today. So listen carefully, because you and I want to have that peace in our lives, but that's the tool that God gave us, actually, to have the life that he's called us to live. And funny thing is, but it's the one that also is like a bad movie. <laughs> you know, you, I remember when I was a little kid, I know some of you have heard this before, I, I remember seeing the, uh, some werewolf movies like in the 1960s. And I remember sitting there, I was, must have been maybe I was seven years old, and you know, I was watching a black and white television and the werewolf came up out of the television set practically and was glowing out the eyes at me. And I went and hid. <laughs> <laughs> that image kept repeating over and over again in my head, and I was actually at a friend's house. And I'm sitting in my friend's house, and I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, we're, it's late at night, and all of a sudden, I wake up in the bed, and I see these two eyes coming down at me. <laughs> like this, I'm coming to get you. And I thought, I screamed at the top of my lungs and woke up the entire family. <laughs> and it was the cat. <laughs> the question is, is how many of us experience that in our own lives, with our own fears and our insecurities, where they're not founded in anything that's real? And not being founded in anything that's real God in our lives brings us into a place where he wants to teach us how to overcome those things that are not real so that we could enter into the place where he dwells. Because what you're going to learn today is that God is the only thing that is actually real. He is the one that is. If we go, I don't know how many people brought your Bibles with you. Well, next to you is one. <laughs> Go to the very first verse in Genesis. <clears throat> See, and the world's calling me right now. <laughs> My phone. <laughs> Saturday, still coming after me. Genesis 1. Anybody want to read it? Just the first verse. In the beginning, God. Think about that statement. In the beginning, God. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If God, it says, created the heaven and the earth, in your life, what created you? God. Now, we can understand that by reading it in the Bible. We can understand that if I'm telling you right now. But about 2 o'clock in the afternoon when everything in your life is going around you, do you believe that God created the heaven and the earth? Honestly, because we only truly do, the only actions in our lives are really what we believe. We only do what we believe in our life. And because we only do what we believe, we walk that narrow path where we believe that God, but we say that we believe, but believing is not something that's passive. It's something that's active in your life. It's really a verb, not a noun. I believe, and in turn, I act. I believe, and in turn, I act. So in believing, when I act, when I act, what's going to take place in my life? You're going to show forth fruit of that belief. That means you know. You know. That means that when everything is going on around you that is crazy, wasn't it the word of God that said, and God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says I believe it's in Galatians, that everything was created in him and through him, and nothing was created without him. And so if you're going to experience life, that means you're experiencing life because God created it. You see, we can understand that intellectually because you know why? We've been conditioned to. But do you know it? Do you know that God created everything? Do you know that everything is created in him and through him and nothing, not some things, nothing is created without him? What we're going to be doing today is we're going to walk through some scriptures today that begin to unlock how we can begin to understand that concept. Because if you can understand that concept, you're going to find out something that has been with you your entire life since before you were born. In fact, since the councils of eternity. In fact, since God existed, you have always been known, right? So if you would, go to Exodus 25.8. Is everybody following so far? Okay. No, it's right here. Yep. This is called the prelude. No. Nope. We'll tell you. Yep, John, I mean, uh, uh, Exodus 25, 8. I wrote it backwards. Anybody want to read it? Any volunteers? Can you find it? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay. Let them make a sanctuary, a dwelling place, that he might dwell among them. When God redeemed Israel out of Egypt, it was always his desire. And in fact, if you read up to dwell among them, that word among actually should be translated as in. I'm not going to go through why that is. But it's really translated as in. And what does um, God want them to build? He wants them to build a traveling tabernacle, doesn't he? It's a tent. And God's going to dwell in a tent? Why would God want to dwell in a tent? In our, uh, in our understanding, we, we want him to live in some big temple, right? We want him to live in a cathedral with lots of gold. But what was God's desire? Desire was to live in you. He wants to dwell in you. You are that traveling tabernacle. You are the one that God chose to dwell in. 
And in God choosing to dwell in you, what he's done is he's made it so that as you begin to live and move and have your being in him, you begin to see, and we're not going to go through all the, all the different components of that tabernacle today, but we're going to go through it to understand enough about it that you know that God dwells in you. Okay? Go, who wants to read Deuteronomy 6, 3 through 5? Sister Martha? Amen. So what's the, 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 the thing that we want to show you is that God, he says, is one. It's called the Shema. It is the most powerful prayer in all of Scripture. And it goes like this. It's Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. He is one. Where are you? Where would you see yourself in the oneness with God? You can raise your hand. Hanging over a precipice. Hanging over a precipice. <laughs> about ready to fall in. <laughs> How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself? We have to be honest with ourselves. Today is a, like a retreat. And we want to really start to discover how we really feel inside what's going on inside of us for real because a lot of times we go to church and we hear the sermon we we listen to the music and um we go our merry way and guess what happens to our life zero nothing and then there's no fruit in our lives and if there's fruit the only fruit you have is your actions are running away or doing things in the world and those two have some merit, because I love to run away. I don't get a chance to too often. <laughs> and I'm surrounded personally by the world like a Mack truck sometimes. But God has a reason for that. And I'm going to show you that reason and how he works. So how, let's ask the question again. How in your life can you see yourself one with God? Or maybe you can't. And it's okay to say that. Anybody have any comments? It's a hard thing to understand to be one. To have a oneness with God. What we're going to do now is we're gonna, I'm going to hand you out a paper. All right? And this is something you can keep. All right? Because this is where we are many times in our lives. We're caught between this tree here, which is, everybody's seeing it, is the tree of the knowledge of good, good and evil and the tree of life. Everybody got one? Now, many of these things we've been touching on for a couple of years now, and I'm doing this on purpose to hope we can get beyond this to the next level in our lives. <clears throat> That's good, thanks. So, if God is one, then why is it that I have so much conflict in my life? Let's walk through it for a minute. Okay, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all right, means that things are black and white, male and female, right, that we can see the differences. 
the results are, and none of us ever do it, is pass the buck. <laughs> it's that woman you put me with. Oh, no, she's here. <laughs> How many times do you do that? Because what are you doing when you pass the buck? You're, you're trying to protect yourself because you're afraid. Deep down inside, there's a fear. You don't experience that oneness. You're not experiencing that oneness. You're experiencing fear. You want to protect yourself. The other thing is, I am the provider. Now, I would like to think, I am the provider. Hard concept to overcome when the Word of God says just the opposite. He is the provider. So, when our kids get to a certain age in life, we sit them down and we say, you're going to get married, you're going to have children, and you've got to learn to be a provider. I know that I had parents that did the same thing to me. Scared the living daylights out of me, and I went out there and tried to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> Fifty-something years later, I'm still trying to do it. How many of us are in that same place? All of us are. We have to be honest with ourselves exactly where we are in life. Hey, Butch. <laughs> where we are. So the other thing is, is that we see differences. How many of us, we look out in life and we see the differences of life, the differences in people? In fact, today it's more striking than ever before in life where you see the differences that are around you, correct? Those differences can be so pronounced. I mean, we live in the great state of Vermont, as an example, right? I mean, I never saw a more political state in my entire life. <laughs> When I was living in Florida, I was kind of like apolitical. I didn't even care. <laughs> Here, you know, I get off the plane, they have a Bernie sticker on them about the size of their shirt, <laughs> you know? And you never know who you're going to talk to. And if they do talk to you, they get all, all steamed up about it. And they think that you're from the other side, just using that example, or male and female, right? But isn't it funny, and I'm just going to bring this up, we'll go down a small little thing, is that when you see people that are, that are going through, like, gay, as an example, right? What's going on with them? They're trying to tell you there is no difference between male and female, correct? Because spiritually, they're not wrong. But physically, they are. Because just like when you're looking for God in your life, you're looking for God because you're looking for him in a drug, maybe alcohol or sex or, or you don't know who you are anymore, so you become what? Whatever. Whatever you identify with. And that's where our culture is today. And so we find differences based on how we identify. And how we identify is, is and, uh, and I'll bring up the statement and I'll bring it up later again to explain it, is you say to yourself, I am. I am this. I am that. And what that does is, in this world, is it brings out the differences. But it does in the spiritual world, which we're going to learn on the tree of life, that God wants you to be able to see above all that. So listen to, what he, listen to the rest. We'll go to the rest of it. We're covering what do we cover with? What's the first thing that happened to Adam and Eve after they fell? What did they try to do when God was coming through? They covered themselves with what? With fig leaves. Do you know what fig leaves stand for? False religion and false ideas. More people are hiding behind a fig tree or a fig leaf in religion than you can shake a stick at. They hide behind that because why? I was afraid. Because you said you knew that God created the heaven and the earth. You said that God is. You said it because you believed it. 
you meet people all around you that have this concept in their lives that, oh yes, I believe in God, but yet their actions spell differently. Guess what? Our actions say differently. And so we cover ourselves. We cover ourselves with false ideas because those ideas give us a sense of protection in our lives. That sense of protection gives us the ability to function and live in this world. False ideologies about how we should live. These are things that have been passed down to us from generation to generation to generation. And we hide behind it because we don't want to find out who we really are inside. And the reason for that is it's because we've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I call it the tree of duality. Because there's a little bit of truth in all of it. Self-conscious. How did you know that you were naked? Isn't that what God said? We were naked, so we hid. How did you know? You became self-aware. What is the whole world trying to do today? Aren't they still becoming self-aware? Isn't that where we have a lot of, not only our falseness in our own religion as Christians, and believe me, it is deep and full, but also in other religions or other concepts where we're trying to become self-aware, we're trying to become self-conscious. And that's where you have your new age movement that comes along that wants to have, be conscious, but they don't want to take responsibility for where it comes from. So they're naked and aware. Not responsible. We find ourselves in a place where that was your fault and I'm not responsible for you. Taking responsibility is an attribute of the tree of life. We'll, and we'll get to that. Greek thinking. Now, I'm sure you've heard me say this before. Do you know what Greek thinking is? Greek thinking is when you think linearly. You shrink and straight. Like Greek thinking would be you're born and you die. Hebraic thinking is a circular thinking. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. In fact, in Hebrew thinking... It doesn't have past or present. It's complete or incomplete. But in Greek thinking, you have past and present. And guess what in Greek thinking? You cannot change your past. And then you ask yourself, why do I always seem to repeat the bad things that go on in my life? And so what becomes of you? You become hopeless. You think, I'm never going to get out of this thing because I'm just going to die. My life is over. I have no cure for my life. That's a very hopeless way of thinking, isn't it? And so we want to learn today as we go along is how do you get out of that thinking? And I showed you the tool not too long ago, but we're going to go back into it. I... I am God. Yep, you're God. And everybody else is not. <laughs> now, we would say to ourselves, I would never think that. <laughs> but believe me, in your individuality, you have become a God. And individuality is a concept that comes from Greek thinking. Hebraic thinking never had that. They thought about the tribe. They lived and died for the tribe. They made sure that the people around them were, were a part of who they were. Today, I mean, we live if you, here it's maybe a little different. We actually have houses too far away. We don't know our neighbors. 
even when I lived in South Florida, you had like three feet between houses, maybe four. You didn't know your neighbors. That's why here we've tried to promote community so that you have community living because that's circular thinking. And in order to be able to live in community it means you have to be responsible for your neighbor. To live in community life, you have to be responsible for what goes on around you. In fact, in circular thinking, you become responsible for everything that takes place in your life. That's not my responsibility. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Outside the garden. Remember? And then what did he do when he sent them out? Anybody remember? He put animals? Cigars? A guard. <laughs> a guard. <laughs> Smell your cigars, kept everybody. No, he put a guard. He put cherubims, with right with a with a flaming sword, right, and he barred them from entering into the tree of life, which we're going to go to pretty soon. Is everybody following so far? Because if to understand this, we'll we'll be able to understand where we're going to go today. All right, you'll be able to reference back to this piece of paper. In fact, keep it because you're going to go back to it a lot in your life. This paper, I've lived with it for about seven years. Every time I get in trouble, I look and I go, okay, <laughs> where am I supposed to be at? Oh, yeah, I am a God. Yep, I'm doing good. <laughs> what am I covering myself with? Okay, no rest. How many of us would die for some rest in our heart? Do you know that the Word of God says that if you cannot rest, God will not be your provider. If you cannot find that rest, you cannot be in the presence of God. That's serious. You are outside. How do I get that rest? We know that in Genesis chapter 2, I think it's about verse 1 or 2. I won't we'll, we'll go into it. I'll just explain it to you. It says that on the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. And then what did he do? He woke up. <laughs> he, what he did was, is he actually began, okay, another, almost like another creation. Well, I mean, it's not really that. But it's the way a lot of us, when we read the Bible, look at it. All right? He goes into the eighth day. The eighth day means above nature. He goes into a place because the Word of God teaches that first comes the flesh and then comes the Spirit. And we're going to learn to live and move and have our being in the spiritual realm in Him while living in the world but not being of the world. So rest is really important. And that rest is not a rest like the word of God, what we think it is. Because what does Jesus say? I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Not as the world gives, right? Because the only peace you get in the world is when you buy a brand new car. <laughs> and the peace leaves when the bill comes. <laughs> You get that wonderful new house. And a couple years later, the cloudbirds start coming down. And you're out there like Father Paul, fixing them up. <laughs> because what happens in this world is that it decays. Because what's valuable is not what's on the outside so much as it's on the inside. All right? Lower self and the fesh, I'll get into that. Logical thinking. Logical thinking is something that you and I do every single day, right? Well, many times you'll meet somebody, maybe sometime you'll sit with me, and that doesn't sound very logical. But if it wasn't for logical thinking, we probably couldn't have gone to the moon. 
So logical thinking has its place, just like everything else has its place. But logical thinking doesn't allow for creative thinking as much because you've got to have it all figured out. I'm just giving you little synopsis. Temporal light, and I know some of you have heard me talk about it. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, the first day, what does God do? He creates light, right? The first day God created the light. That word is or. That is the light of inspiration, by the way. The light of instruction that goes on inside of you. In this, on the fourth day, he creates may or. That is the sun, the moon, a sconch. That's your physical light. And so we live by a physical light, but never experience many times in our lives that inspiration, that inner instruction that comes into our lives so that we can begin to move in him as opposed to just moving in the world. And so that's what was open to us when we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was always there. Remember, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the midst of the garden with the tree of life. Outside the tabernacle, no entrance. That's why we're a priestly people, a holy people, a people set apart because we have access. And why do we have access? Because Jesus went to the cross for us. But what happened to us? Most of us walk around just like we've never had access. Even though it's been given to us. We're like people that have been given an amazing gift. And we, we walk around saying, I don't know where the gift is. And it's sitting right in front of us, including me. How do I access the gift that God has given me? So we find ourselves living outside the tabernacle. Perceived dominion, nothing can happen without you. I'm in charge of my own place. I have dominion. But that's not dominion that God gives us. And we're going to learn about that. You've heard me for many times from the pulpit talk about imagination. I think almost every single sermon in two and a half years. And it's on purpose. <laughs> because faith cannot work without imagination. Do you know that love cannot function without imagination? Those things in our lives that you cannot, are not tangible, in order to be able to understand them, you have to have the ability to understand concepts in your head without physically seeing them, right? So faith is what? What is the biblical definition of faith? We should all know it by now. Anybody? You're hesitating. <laughs> what? Yeah. Or you can say, believe in those things that are not as if they were. Okay? What we do in our lives is we believe those things that are <laughs> around us we believe the bad report before we believe God's report. We believe the doctor's reports before we believe what God has to say about something. We believe the bill collector or we believe the problems before we believe that God is our provider or our healer or our deliverer. And so imagination, okay, always produces but when imagination becomes fantasy, it produces nothing. Fantasy is on the side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Fear. Fear. I know that none of us are afraid because we're macho men. <laughs> but that fear that you're reading here is only fallen awe. 
because God wants us to be in awe of him, right? But when that awe is fallen, what happens? Because we're in awe of him, because we're coming into his presence, we're amazed at who he is. That's the kind of fear that it's talking about. But once that fear is fallen and you're not living, you're living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happens to you? That fear falls and you become afraid because you've been separated from the creator of the universe. And so you live in fear, not knowing what's going to happen to you, everything's going wrong. It was Job so famously said, that which I feared the most has come to pass. And what did he do? He made sacrifices for his kids because he was afraid that something might happen to them. And so we act out our fears in our lives and what takes place? That which we feared the most comes to pass in our life. Hold on to that for a minute because that's going to be key today. Conditional love. I only love you because you love me. But what God wants to do is he wants to teach us how to love unconditionally. And we're living in our fallen nature. And what is our fallen nature? Well, when you're about 12 and 13 years old, you don't feel like you have a fallen nature. But as you get older, what happens to your nature? <laughs> your nature begins to decay, right? Our outer bodies begin to decay. That's just a simple level. On a more deeper level, we're living in a fallen nature means that you're living in sin. You're living in the, in, 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 in the problems of life. The fallen nature sees the problems of life and cannot see above them. It's that part of your brain that, for whatever reason, it, it doesn't have the ability to look beyond the circumstances of life. That's living in your fallen nature. Let's just walk to the other side. <clears throat> the cross. I remember sitting with a pastor about a year ago, and... Um, I, was, I said to him, I, and I'm not going to mention names, but I said to him, I said, you know, isn't it amazing that Jesus would give his life on the cross? And he goes, yeah. And I go, and that cross has so many benefits from it because it's the tree of life. He made, gave us entrance into that tree of life, right, so that we could have life again. Oh no, that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I said, no, if, if it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're lost. <laughs> and he argued with me. and told me I was absolutely wrong. Can you imagine? And guess what? The only way that you can understand the tree of life is if you've experienced it. You have to have experienced that tree of life because it's not logical thinking. It's foolishness, the word of God says, right? To the who? To the Greeks. To the Greek thinker. To the linear thinker. It makes no sense. So if you want to have dominion, victory, blessings in your life, if you want to be able to learn to walk with God, in the midst of your trials and tribulations, have peace with him, knowing that he is with you, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the cross. It's the only way that you can get past that fiery sword of the cherubim. I always think of cherubims of like shapeshifters because in Scripture, you'll see them in different forms throughout Scripture. And they're guarding. They're keeping you out. But Jesus gives you entrance. And so what's the first thing he does? The two shall be as one. Oneness. The Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Echad means one. You know what Echad means? It's like a, you know, in my kitchen right now, there's a whole bunch of bananas. And all of them are stuck on one thing. 
That means it's one set of bananas, right? What do they call a thing of bananas? Anybody know? A bunch. It's a one bunch. That's echad. It's one bunch. Or a, or a bunch of grapes, all put on one. So it's a multitude to become one. That's what ahad means. And so you and I, in the tree of life, we become what? One. When Adam meets this lovely lady in the garden who came from his side, what does he say? He prophesies what? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? And they talked about becoming one. And when Christ talks about his bride, he talks about being one, doesn't he? That bride, the brideship. And so the tree of life, the cross, and why is it that the cross is so pronounced in being able to bring us into that oneness? I'll quickly tell you. Do you know that the law of God says that if you get divorced, right, and you go and marry somebody else, what have you committed? Adultery. Adultery. Now, in a world like we live in today, <laughs> most people have been through a divorce, haven't they? And so you hear something like that, you go, oh my gosh, there's no hope for me. And that's not true. Because scripture was written not to the outer man as much it was written to the inner man. Your inner man is pure and clean. It is what is got, it's what is redeemed. Because if it wasn't, and it was the outside flesh that redeemed, we are a hopeless people, aren't we? Because none of us have a redeem. Our flesh is going to the grave, the word of God says. But the inner man, the part of you that comes from God is going back to God that's living in this vessel. That's the one that is becoming one with Christ. <clears throat> Who wants to read John 17, 21? <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus' prayer went unanswered? No. That was his, one of his final prayers before he went to the cross. That we may be one with him as he is one with the Father. How do we live? Like it never happened. But let me tell you, it did happen. We did become one. We have access. We're going to learn about that today. So male and female, marriage as one. Eternal life. For those who believe in him, what does he give you? Eternal life. What does it mean to have eternal life? What? Is there death? No, actually death is a temporal thing. It only came into our lives because we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you're redeemed and you have access, what do you get? Eternal life. You get life. Why do they call it the tree of life? <laughs> and so we have access. We have that tree that we can eat from, the fruit of giving us access. You have eternal life. I mean, th th we can go that one for, for a long time. In fact, forever. <laughs> it's that amazing, all right, to understand what that means in our lives. God is my provider. I love it when you go to Jamaica, they sing a song. God is my provider. I will not beg for bread. I've never seen the righteous begging for bread, David said. You know, how many of us in this room or in the world do you see people that are begging for bread, who are struggling in life just for 
a little bit, who are destroyed in life because they have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they think that they are the provider when the word of God says that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, that nothing was created without him, that everything was created in him, and that God wants to learn how to flow through us. And so if we're going to learn in our lives how to overcome, we have to learn to allow God to be the provider. A lesson hard for me personally to learn. To let it go sometimes. One with God, one with God we talked about. God conscious, aware of God. This is where I get in trouble. Well, you can't say consciousness because it's a new age thing, <laughs> right? But self-conscious is a new age thing. God-conscious is a God thing. Amen. But it's all conscious. And do you know what it means to be conscious? It means to be aware. Wake up! To be alive! So... When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they realized that they were naked. They became self-aware. When you eat of the tree of life, you become aware of God in your life. Most of us, in our fleshly existence, because we live as a duality, our outside flesh is a part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our inside man, that inner man, is attached to the tree of life once it's been redeemed. And so we want to be able to put our eyes on what's already been redeemed and not on what's on the outside flesh, the part of us that is causing us so many problems in our life. Always, like Paul said, I know what is right to do. You see, he understood the conflict but I find myself doing wrong because he understood that conflict. It's up to us to begin to understand that there is a conflict going on and that conflict is between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And guess what? How do you begin to receive from those trees? It's what you eat. So watch your diet. I love carbs. <laughs> it's not that diet. <laughs> your spiritual diet. What have you been eating? God knows what you need before you ask. Isn't that what the Word of God says? Yet we walk around like God never even heard of us <laughs> or even knows what we want in our life. Are you hearing me? We start to beg God and pray. And when we, the more in trouble we get, the more we begin to beg. The more fragile we feel, the more we begin to come into that place when he wants to teach us that he is, that God is. That's that trusting relationship. And we're going to see the difference, hopefully, before the day is out between an active lifestyle and a passive lifestyle. Because if you were to go to your parents when they sat down and talked to you about life, right, and you had to go out and make a living and you had to do all these things, or anybody in life, you would say, well, you have to do this. Because it's practical, we would say, right? So how am I supposed to understand the, that God is my provider that he is the one that works with through me, and how am I supposed to understand what my job is? How am I supposed to be able to do it? We're going to hopefully see that today. Ask in prayer, and it is yours. How many of us read that and really believe it? It says in Mark, he says, ask in prayer, believing and it is yours. We ask in prayer and hope that God heard us. When Jesus prayed, do you think he walked around? In fact, one scripture teaches us that there was one place he says, I'm doing this for the people. He revealed to you how he prayed. And it was 
looking at an impossible situation, a dead body that not only was dead, but it says he stank. <laughs> you remember? And he goes to the tomb with Mary and Martha and the crowds. He says, do you believe that I am the resurrection? Oh, yes, Lord. I believe. But they didn't understand. He turns to the tomb and he says, and he turns to the Father and he says, Father, for them, so that they might understand. I know that you hear me, and I know that you always hear me. That's the prayer of faith with imagination. And he says to the tomb, Lazarus, come forth and freaks everybody out. <laughs> Paula? Okay, you have a question. Okay, so apparently I was prayed a mess because the Lord said to me, hide from me. Hide from me. I'm not sure I get that. Mm. Actually, we're going to get into that today, so hold that question. Because okay. I'm like a lawyer today. I'm building a, I'm building a case. Okay. <laughs> But that's a great question. <clears throat> Hebrew thinking, circular thinking. And what I mean by circular again is there's no beginning or end to it. See others' faults in you. So when I see you, I see myself. In fact, the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts that God gave us is that we see ourselves in one another. That's learning to eat from the tree of life. God is God, and we're not. <laughs> Pretty simple concept, you think, right? But not always. We're living inside the garden. Noah, now that says Noah there. Noah means rest. It also says, you see, it says Manoah. Have you ever heard of the term equanimity? It means no matter what's going on in my life, what happens to you? I have peace. I'm at rest. Higher self, Shema, Sh Shemaya, which I'm not going to get into today, but we might down someday down the road. Creative thinking. Creative thinking comes from the tree of life. Light of instruction. Remember I said mayor is the physical light or is the spiritual light. It's the light of instruction or the light of, or the light of inspiration. Inside the tabernacle, real dominion. When you were in the Garden of Eden, right, what did God give you? Didn't he give you dominion? And when Christ went to the cross, what did he give you? Didn't he say, I'm giving you dominion? And what have we done with that dominion? And what, did, and what kind of dominion did he give you? I'm going to go down to the state house and say, well, I have dominion over you. You think it's going to go over well? <laughs> They'll go, okay, I guess. <laughs> no, it's dominion here. If you have dominion in here, in your garden, then you'll have dominion out here. But if you try to have dominion out here, you cannot affect what goes on in here. What we try to do in our lives is we try to affect the outside world, hoping that our inside world will change. When in really, we should be doing is working on the inside man to affect what goes on out here. Imagination, one of my favorite words. Imagination always produces fruit. Fantasy doesn't. Remember awe? The fear of God, being in awe of God. Perfect love, the word of God says, What does what? Cast out, fear. Cast out fear. So that you could live in him. Restored nature. That's your inner man. That's that inner nature, that part of you that is connected to God. Faith. And what is faith? And here's another definition of faith. It's confidence. And guess what it's confidence in? 
things unseen, knowing that which is invisible, knowing that it is a done, a finished work. Your confidence. Have you ever met someone with zero confidence? Do you believe them? No. You try to give them some confidence, don't you? And you're learning to live above nature. Above nature. I remember once I was with Father Paul and I was down in Jamaica and we had a bus load of kids and adults. This is, I think we had like 30 some odd people. And um, we had, uh, I mean, we had all these stops to go to. Everything was going crazy. Then we had one stop where everybody was living in a chicken coop. But it would smell like terrible chickens. <laughs> I had people ready to kill me. <laughs> and all I remember is one thing I had to do. I, I just kept one thing in my head. Walking on water. I have to just walk on water. <laughs> you have to become above it. You have to learn to live above that nature to, then to get discouraged. Not easy. And so we find that what Christ is doing at the cross, when he's going to the cross, he brings us back into that oneness so that in that oneness we could truly begin to walk with God in our lives. So how do we do this? You can turn, turn the screen. We went through that already. So we're going to start to go through today the tools to be able to do this that God has given us in his word. Go to the first, go to the first one. And the first one is obedience. Is obedience. Let me pull up my notes so you can read the scripture. How's everybody doing? Are you following? Yep. Okay. After this part, we'll go get some lunch in about a half an hour, and then we'll come back, and we're prayerfully that it will be a discussion. All right? Take this with you and start to discuss it, because this really goes to the heart of who we are. Okay? So, if you want, go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Whoever gets it, they can read it if they want. Chapter 6, Ephesians 6, 5 through 7. But by the way, when it means slaves in there, I, I'll give you a quick story. Many years ago, I, I was with this HR girl. She was the HR person from Bell South. <laughs> Butch would know Bell South. <laughs> that was the telephone service for, for all of, most of Florida. And I one time I said to her, I said, I said, could you explain something to me? Where did employment law come from? <laughs> she said, oh, from the slave laws. <laughs> And I go, oh, and she was dead serious. When you work for somebody, or you are, you know, you have someone that is over you, if you have a parent that you're under, okay, it's the same thing. Or if you work for a company, they've bought you at a price for what you're doing. And they're obviously going to try to extract out of you the value that they pay you. Correct? If you're a boss and you have people working for you, aren't you going to do that? So listen to what it says. This is from the King James. Servants, be obedient to them that are masters according to the flesh. Employees, be obedient to them that are your bosses, your supervisors, according to the flesh with fear and trembling in signalness of your heart as unto Christ. 
Now, there's another scripture that says, it's better for us to obey God than man. Which one is right? You remember when the apostles were being persecuted by the, by the uh, they got called before the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the court, and they were being flogged and whipped, and they were being told, you can't preach in the name of Christ. And then did they say, it's better for us to be obedient to God than to man. But look what Paul's saying. So should they have? Another example was Jesus himself going to the cross, comes to the praetorium. And I think it was Pontius Pilate that said it to him. Pilate says to him, do you not know that I have the power to have you crucified? And what did Jesus say to him? The only way you have power of me is because it was from God himself. What does Paul say here? With fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. Seeing Christ in everything and everyone around you, even when it doesn't seem right. Because who is your provider? Isn't God your provider? Not your boss. I remember sitting in a meeting. Hopefully he's not listening because he'll know who he is. And one of the employees of that company wanted to do something in church. And I remember sitting there because I was one of the managers of the company. And he goes, he goes, doesn't he know that I'm his provider? I could fire him like that and he'd have nothing. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh. God is his provider, not you. He says, in order for him to tithe, I had to provide for him. By the way, that's an environment that I came out of. <laughs> Could you imagine? Because I am God. You see how that, you see where the conflict begins to take place? See how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when you've eaten of that fruit? But if you are truly learning to walk in the Spirit, Paul teaches us that you need to be able to see Christ in them. Are you kidding me? That's how I went home some nights. <laughs> With that conflict going on in your life. How many of us have faced that? in different ways, all of us in this room, because we live in this world. What are you going to eat from? If I bit from that tree, what would have happened to me? Maybe I would have eaten that tree, and I would have become the same thing. But my inner person, my inner man, was totally antithetical to that. I couldn't understand it. Why would you want to miss what God has given to us? I want to eat from the tree of life. Sister Dithna. Is there some type of a parallel, parallel of um, when those yes. three guys were, they refused to eat from the table of the king and they wanted to eat the food that the Lord gave them? Are oh, you talking about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, yes. and Abednego? Yes. Well, yeah, it's That's very similar to that. Parallel. It's because they ate different food and they were blessed for it. And the reason why they were blessed for it is because they were keeping the commandments of God in their life. And when they kept the commandments in obedience, what happened? God blessed. And in the midst of the fire, who was with them? Christ was with them. What, we, what would you call that? Would you call that being in rest? That would be like Manoah. Manoah means equanimity. That means that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the fire, you find it. In fact, many times in our lives, and I know I'm going down into a little bit of a rabbit trail, I'm going to try to stay focused today, is that when you get into those places in your life, God has allowed that in order to get you to focus. You need those things in your life. I don't like those things in my life. And the more closer you're getting to the presence of God, guess what? the more pronounced those kind of things are going to take place in your life because this world, as the Word of God says, is a schoolroom. It's a training ground for a life that is eternal. 
All the things that have gone on in our life, if you can see them, Sister um, um, Gabriel read a teaching at chapter the other night, and it was just beautiful about chastity. And that chastity, can you say, just give a couple quicks, but you got to speak up. You don't remember it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's that complaining. I think you guys read it for chapter this past week, didn't you? The same one. Because what happens when you begin to complain? We're going to get into it, but when you do that, you go into the fire with no protection. You're going to get burned up. When you're out of obedience to God, you get burned up. Look at when the priest, when, when um, um, it was Aaron's sons, I forgot their names, but they go to bring an offering to the Lord, and it was not the correct, it was, it, it was unclean fire that they bring. And what happened to them? <laughs> Remember, we're talking about, I'm not trying to, it's not about being scared, it's to be an understanding God, the obedience to God in your life. And he wants us to learn obedience not only to those around us that God has called to, as unto Christ, but he also wants to teach us to God himself, right, and to his word. So as you learn to do that in your life, what happens? God's blessings begin to flow. So these become the simple tools that you use in your life. And what happens when you come out of that obedience? Well, you're not thinking oneness anymore, are you? You're thinking you're eating from a different tree. And when you eat from a different tree, what happens to you? You have ideas and concepts that you start to live by that are not the same as the ones that are around you. Where is the church today? I don't have to say much, do I? They're eating from every single pot, every single whim that's out there, and there's no focus on having. Do you think that Jesus, when he was walking the earth and he had his disciples with him called the Talmudim, when you had a a rabbi like Christ and you lived under that rabbi, you ate and drank and slept and everything with him. And in the cases of the apostles for three and a half years, and they sound just like some people I know, they repeat what he says over and over again because they live with him. We do that in life. And yet right in this very room, we find ourselves going after other food. And what happens? It divides the body of Christ. You need to eat from one pot, trusting that God is your provider. What do we do? We go out to every other place in the world saying, that's my meat. God has spoken to me. He's given me, and I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm trying to show you how to get into it. When you hear those things, you need to filter it. And that's where maturity comes. Because obedience to those that God has placed over us teaches us how to live in the oneness of God and not be ripped apart. That's what happened in this room, by the way. They said, oh no, God is speaking to me personally. There is a place for God to speak to you personally. But there is a place. Could you imagine you work for a prosperous company and everybody in the room decides to do their own thing. How far do you think that company is going to go? Not very far, right? So what's the tools they use? It's called employment law, (laughs) right? They have to treat them fairly today. You have all these things you got to do, right? I know that you want to get rid of somebody, you write them up until you figure out how to get rid of them, right? 
employment love. But what are we learning to do? Doing it as unto Christ. So that when we come here, the same thing needs to take place in our lives. As unto the Lord, because Father Leo is not my provider. God bless you for that. God is my provider. He is my healer. He is my deliverer. But I'm going to learn to focus to eat from one tree. And when I hear the other messages out there, I've got to learn to bring it into the filter so that I know what to do it within the context that God has called me to. When that takes place, you begin to see fruit. So obedience is primary. Without obedience, you cannot move forward. You know, they, teach, they go to the warfare schools here. Could you imagine disobedience in the army? I mean, they caught some guys drinking in some foreign country not too long ago, and they brought them home, and they weren't very, you know, we're tough on them, right? Because how can you serve and be in the military and not? Now, I'm not saying the church is the military. The church is about learning the instructions of Almighty God because you live eternally with him, and this is the training ground. And so God wants to teach us how to live. Is everybody okay with that? Because it's really important to understand. I thought about talking about that at the end, but it's better to be at the beginning. we got to hear that because we're not going to grow. We're going ha- to have all these things go on in our lives because we can't seem to function. We get it. Because the tools have to come close to us to be able to use them. Somebody want to read Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. By the way, that also makes responsible the people that are your teachers and your leaders because the word of God has a word for them as well. Teaching them to do what? To be loving, to be kind, to be serving, to be servant ministers of God and to feed the flock what they need to have. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. Anybody got it? Did you hear that? And when you're obedient, you're obedient unto Christ, but you're seeing Christ in one another. Are you seeing that? And then when you're doing that, what's going on? The Word of God says it's up to you to be a path to a wise man's house, to hear the Word of God. It's up to you to be able to do that. You have to stretch yourself out so that you bring yourself into subjection to the will of God in your life. And when you do that, what does he say? It says willingly and obedient. The first word is being willing. And if you are willing, just being willing gives you the impetus that you need to be able to get into that place. I remember our bishop years ago, he says, just be willing to be willing. Are we willing? Are we willing to get into that place? We're never going to be perfectly obedient, but we're going to be willing to be there in our lives so that we can have the blessings of God, so that we will eat the good of the land. That land is where? It's not some far off place. That land is right here. And you're going to have blessings flowing in your life because you've eaten the good of the land that has been produced from your own heart. That's where you should be having it. Not the food that we're going to eat at lunch in a few minutes. (laughs) Because I'm going to tell you that most people have better food, you know, like kings and queens. I bet you they eat beautifully, right? Right? Better than us. 
Because the fruit is spiritual fruit that you want to eat of. That fruit that gives you peace, that fruit that gives you blessings in your life, that is able, like Sister Dimpna has reminded us, is that in the midst of the fire, you find Christ. Because why? They were obedient to the word of God even when the world around them was antithetical to the word. And that's what we live in today. James 1, 25. James 1, 25. <clears throat> Whoever finds it first, speak it loudly. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The perfect law of liberty. Anybody have a clue what that means? What would be the law of liberty? What Christ has set us free? Doesn't he give us liberty? So the law of liberty. Freedom's ideal law of liberty. Every single law that you find in the Old Testament was transferred to the inner man. Did you know that? Do you know that most of the laws in the Old Testament you cannot live this day? Most of them can't be lived without a temple. And if they did animal sacrifices today, you'd probably have some corner organization looking for you. <laughs> Especially maybe in Vermont, right? <laughs> now, in Israel, not too long ago, they started animal sacrifice again. Did you know that? And they've reestablished the Aaronic priesthood. How they have done that, the records were lost in 70 AD, so I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure they must figure it out, and I'm not the one, I'm not, I'm not part of the Sanhedrin, so I'm sure they'll figure it out. And it's actually called the Sanhedrin. The perfect law of liberty is the idea, the understanding that the laws of God are written on your heart. Right? And being written on your heart, you're going to learn to live them. And every once in a while, I'll bring out some of those laws, the ones that even seem ridiculous, and show you how they're actually written on your heart and how to overcome. But the law of liberty means that you have liberty in Christ. And when you look into the mirror of freedom's ideal law, that law of liberty, you have freedom in your life. You're no forgetful listener. You have gone to the cross. Christ lives in you, and now you are an overcomer. And is that what God wants? We read it in Revelations, right? And Revelation says, for them that have overcome, the overcomers in life, those are the ones that God gives you the ability to be pillars in his temple. And so if you're looking into that law of liberty, right, you have the spiritual work in your life because of your obedience to that law. The obedience to that law, knowing that you are free, even when you have someone over you that is miserable, even when the world is miserable to you. That freedom is in you. That's the short of it. That brings us, just before lunch, and we're going to get into um, learning some more of the tools. We'll take a break. But it's the concept of understanding that your imagination is redeemed. You have a redeemed imagination. And to understand that means that your imagination, I want to say something probably is going to push the envelope a tad. That when you understand who God is, when you begin to understand who he is inside, 
If you can understand that you can't understand love without imagination, you can't understand faith without imagination, you can't understand God because he's not flesh and blood without your imagination. Today you are taught that imagination is just whatever. But if you were to go and think linearly and you have a Greek thinking, you still need to learn to use your imagination, don't you? I mean, even the concept of numbers is using your imagination. But when you learn to live by faith in him, God uses your imagination to do it. And who is our father in faith? Abraham? What did he do? God brought him outside. He says, Avram, look at the stars of the sky. Count them. Your prodigy will be as the star of the sky. He was looking at a, pri- a, a wife that couldn't get pregnant, and they were old, really old. He was looking at the impossible, and you're doing what? How could he understand that concept if he didn't have a really good imagination? If God, so God merges with your imagination. He actually becomes one with your imagination. We think that he becomes one with our flesh. He becomes one with our imagination because God, in the end, where is he? He's in you, isn't he? God dwells in you. And that's the part of you that he inhabits. And we're going to get into that. You're going to be able to see that today. We're going to actually walk you through the tools that David used to be able to come into the presence of God, to be able to walk and to have a fruitful life. Even when he was in his worst moments, he was still considered a man after God's own heart. How does that happen? We would like that in our lives, right? Just the fact that you're shaking your head when I said that, it hasn't happened to you yet. (laughs) Because you should know. Okay? So we're going to take a break. Uh, I'm sure they'll have lunch on soon. But I'm asking you to keep your conversation talking about this. Because it's going to be preparation now, as we have lunch, to be able to go into some stuff that you've probably never heard before. And you're going to find it, I think, very interesting in your walk. Okay? Let's just bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the life that you give us. And that, Lord, you have provided us a way through your word to be able to be overcomers, to live in this world but not be of it. That, Lord, you would teach us how to live, Lord Jesus, in the tree of life, that you gave us access. And that, Lord, when we learn to see you in everybody, no matter what, that, Lord, we can see everything as if unto Christ. We bless you and we honor you. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen and amen. And we're going to start back about one. Okay? All right, praise the Lord.